Well, of all the different roles that we play in life, I'm confident there's one that we don't want to play. Any guesses as to what role that is? If you just said parent, shame on you. Uh, although I get it, uh, getting your kids in their Easter clothes and their hair combed just right is no easy task, especially when all they want to do is cram chocolate-covered bunnies into their mouth, right? I remember those days well. It, it, it is hard. Last Sunday morning, I was talking to a young mother, and she shared with me that this Sunday, she planned on spending time in the desert at Joshua Tree rather than dealing with all the Easter hoopla. And I don't blame her, uh, but at the same time, I'm so thankful that not all of you decided to flee to the desert today. I, I am so thrilled that you are here, and my hope and prayer is that when it's all said and done, you will feel it was worth your time. Uh, my name is Sean. I'm one of the ministers here at Campbell. If I haven't had the opportunity to meet you yet, I'd love to do so following our service today. Immediately following this is a brunch and the storybook walk, and I'll be in the, in the Welcome Center. And so if you have just a moment, I'd love to make a connection. I know sometimes it feels weird to talk to the guy who's doing the talk on a Sunday morning. You feel like all he's going to want to talk to about is church stuff. I like to talk about church stuff, but I like to talk about sports and movies and all kinds of stuff. And so just to stop by if you get a chance. I'd love to learn more about you. Back to the original question, what's the one role that most of us don't want to play in life? There you go. That's it, right? That's it right there. None of us wants to be the sucker, right? None of us wants to be the person who gets played as a fool, and yet most of us have that experience from time to time. Now, if you're lucky, you walk away with no more damage than a bruised ego. But typically, the price paid for being duped is absolutely crushing. I was reminded of that recently when I came across the story of Lisa Lincoln's. Her story appeared on CBS News website. It showed up on February 15th. Lisa, at one time, was a background singer for Fleetwood Mac and several other prominent bands. In 2020, she lost her husband, Greg. They had been married for 23 years. And so, obviously, she spent some time grieving that loss, but she came to a point where she decided, you know what, I think I'm ready to try to find love again. And so she signed up on one of those online dating websites. And soon after signing up on that website, she she found just a delightful man by the name of Donald, who was living in Australia at the time. The connection was immediate. It was undeniable. Texting conversations soon became daily phone conversations that would last up to four or five hours at a time. Everything seemed just right. Here's a picture of Lisa and Donald on the screen. You see the sweet little note that he's written to her. It seemed like she had found her next love. But I'm guessing you know where this story is headed. Lisa was being played. By the time she figured it out, she was out over a million dollars. Now... It's easy for us at times to kind of snicker at a person like Lisa, but the truth is most of us have fallen for some, some costly, some big lies. And that's what this new sermon series entitled Duped is really all about. Over the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at some of the lies that society is trying to get us to buy. And honestly, there are some lies that you and I have already bought. And one of those lies goes like this, you only live once. Or as the cool kids used to say, YOLO. <laughs> but basically, if you're lucky, you get 70, 80, 90 years of life. But once you die, that's the end of the story. You're going to be placed in a box and stuck six feet in the ground or maybe spread out over an ocean, never to be seen of or heard of again. And so you better get busy living in a way that brings you as much pleasure as possible while you have the time. Now, this YOLO philosophy has been around for a long, long time. It's, it's not new. In fact, if you go all the way back to the first century world, 
You'll find this philosophy being touted by a group of individuals known as the Epicureans. Who were the Epicureans? Well, the Epicureans were not your prototypical Vegas-type people. They weren't the type of people who are apt to to gamble and booze it up and hit the late-night club. They were more of the, let's dine at a Michelin-rated restaurant and go to a Broadway show type of people. They were refined. They were sophisticated. They liked the finer things in life. They were not the type of people who would take a selfie and say YOLO, but they would say things like this, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. And that was their philosophy. And that right there is a lie. Now, it's not a complete lie. It's true that most of us will die, but this implication that death is the end, well, that's a bunch of hooey. At least as far as a follower of Jesus Christ by the name of Paul was concerned. In fact, he wrote a letter to a group of Christians who are living in Corinth, and he was making this argument to them. To set the context for you, there were a group of church-going people, people who claimed to be followers of Jesus, but they had been duped by false teachers and by Greek pagan culture. They did not deny that Jesus had been raised from the dead, but they did not believe that anybody else would be raised from the dead. And so Paul says basically to them, listen, you can't have it both ways. If Jesus was raised from the dead, then we are going to be raised from the dead. If we're not going to be raised from the dead, then Jesus was not raised from the dead. And if Jesus was not raised from the dead, then don't get all wrapped up in things like religion and ethics and morals because it just doesn't matter at the end of the day if the grave is is the end. You'd be much better off choosing to just do you. In fact, if the credits roll when your life ends, then live your best life now however you define it. Paul, however, was absolutely convinced that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. In fact, he was so convinced by this that he mentions it seven different times in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 alone. Verse 20 is one of the places where he just emphatically states Jesus was raised. He writes this, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He says Jesus is the first, first as in the pioneer, First to overcome death and come back, never to die again. He's the first, but he's not the last. He's paved the way for us. He's the one who defeated death so that one day you and I will be raised as well. Now, who's going to be raised from the dead? Paul answers that question for us in Acts chapter 24 and verse 15. He says there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. Who's going to be raised from the dead? Everybody's going to be raised from the dead. Good people and bad people, people with faith and people without faith, everybody's coming up out of the dirt at some points. And you might be thinking, why should I believe this to be true? Isn't it possible that the Jesus story is the greatest hoax that ever has been played on humanity? Maybe. But I'd ask you to consider this. Most credible historians are in agreement that at one point in history, there was a Jewish man by the name of Jesus who was crucified by the Roman authorities sometime around A.D. 33. They disagree on this, whether they're people of faith or not of faith. They've looked at history, taken it through all the process of historical research, and said, yeah, this guy existed, just like Alexander the Great, just like any other historical figure, he was a real person. Now, where they disagree is this. They disagree on whether or not he actually came back from the dead. Actually, if he was raised from the dead. That's the point of disagreement. And someone, some people would argue, you have to be a huge sucker to buy this part of the Jesus story. Now, guess who shared that opinion at one time? The very same guy who wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
Paul, or as he was known early in his life, Saul. Saul was absolutely convinced that anybody who bought into the Jesus story that he was raised from the dead had absolutely lost their mind. They were just flat out stupid, but they were not only stupid, he also believed that they were a threat, that they were a danger to society. So much so that he dedicated his life in his early years to making sure that he would rid these people from society. He did not want them around. What changed for Paul? What happened that made him change from, I, I don't believe this, to I do believe this? Well, we find Paul's answer to that question in Acts chapter 26, beginning in verse 9. I'll give, to give you some background, at this point, as Paul's speaking, he's under arrest for preaching the name of Jesus. But he is given the opportunity to share his testimony with a man by the name of King Agrippa. And these are the words that Paul shares about his own life. I, too, was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And then when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. And I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them, hunted them down in foreign cities. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priest. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And then I ask, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. For the longest time, Paul believed that Jesus was nothing more than a troublemaker who was crucified on a cross and then laid in a tomb. But that's a pretty hard position to hold when the resurrected Jesus pays you a visit. You say, true, but isn't it possible that Paul made the whole thing up? It is. But my question and response would be, what motivation did he have? He had absolutely zero to gain from a worldly standpoint to make this change. He had so, so much to lose. In making this claim, he knew he would lose friends, he would lose his job, he would lose his reputation, and eventually, eventually it would cost him his life. So why did he make this change? In my mind, there's only one reasonable explanation, and that is he saw the resurrected Jesus. He saw him. The, the one who had defeated death and had overcome death and had come back from the grave, he saw him. And Paul knew this. He knew if that's true, then I'm going to be raised. And so if I die at the hands of these people who don't like what I'm preaching, it's okay because I'm going to be raised as well. Now, just quick side note observation. The depth in which you believe the resurrection story is true is going to fuel your ability to be courageous with your faith. Let me say it the opposite way. If you're not risking anything for the cause of Jesus Christ in this world, you probably need to step back and question, do I really believe that he walked out of the tomb? Because it makes you courageous when you understand and believe this story in the depth of your being. You begin to put things on the line because you know this, this isn't it. There's more. There's more that's going to take place. You say, okay, maybe Paul believed it, but, but isn't it possible that he was mistaken? Why should I trust him any more than the guy who claims he saw Kurt Cobain having a cup of coffee at Starbucks in Seattle? Or the woman who claims that she saw Michael Jackson on the It's a Small World ride at Disney? Why should I believe this guy by the name of Paul? And what I would say to you this morning is that if Paul was the only person to make this claim, 
I'll be the first to admit you should not believe him. But he, he wasn't the only person to make this claim. Even prior to Paul, there were many, many people who made the claim that they had been visited by the resurrected Jesus. In fact, Paul makes reference to these individuals in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He says in verse 3 through 8, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance. The Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, or Peter, and then to the twelve. And after that, He appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And then He appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, He appeared to me also as to one abnormally born Hundreds of people saw the resurrected, resurrected Jesus. And, and when I say saw, I, I don't mean that they caught a glimpse of him from a distance. So many of these people had a direct conversation with the resurrected Jesus. A few of these people, they, they sat around a campfire and they watched the resurrected Jesus make breakfast for them. One individual at least put his hands in the scars and Jesus, or his finger and the scars in Jesus' hands. And most all of these individuals were instructed by Jesus as to how they were to carry out his work in his absence. The point I want you to see this morning is this, that they're seeing Jesus was so up close and personal, there's no way it was a case of mistaken identity. Now, was Paul the last person to see the resurrected Jesus? It seems he's maybe the last person in Scripture and but that doesn't necessarily mean he was the last. Uh, today, there are numerous stories of individuals who have converted from Islam to Christianity who make the claim that they made that decision because they received a visit from the resurrected Jesus through a dream or a vision. In fact, Jerry Truesdale, who works with one-time Muslim leaders who are now planting churches and discipling people in the Muslim world, he reports that 40% of these individuals claim that it was a dream or a vision that set them on this journey to discover more about Jesus the Messiah. And so many of these individuals say that when Jesus appeared to them in a dream or a vision, he invited them to come follow him. Now, whether or not you believe in these types of testimonies, and I'd be the first to admit, if you're like me and you've never had that type of experience, you're probably just a little bit skeptical. And so whether you believe in that type of testimony or not, I want to encourage you to really look at the evidence for the resurrection because the evidence, besides just eyewitness testimony, it's weighty. It is significant. And if you've yet to consider that evidence, I'd encourage you to do so because so much is writing on whether or not this is true. And the cost of being duped about what happens when this life ends is way too high not to take it seriously. What exactly is going to happen when this life ends? Paul says we're going to be raised. Uh, we're not going to be raised from the dead as a spirit, not as a tree, not as a star, not as a dog. We're going to be raised in bodily form. What type of body? Fingers crossed, a body that's a lot more attractive than the one I've been given right here. Did any of you have that same thought go through your mind? Listen, if you're so stinking good looking that that thought didn't go through your mind, you sicken me, okay? So most of us had that thought, right? Now, that whole thought, that whole question at the body, Paul thought was a silly thought, but he knew it was a question that people were apt to ask. And so Paul provides an answer. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 38, But someone will ask, How are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish! What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And when you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just, as, just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. 
Verse 42, so it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. It's a bit of a bummer, but we're not going to get a whole new body. But the good news is this, that this body is just a seed of what my future body will be. That when I am raised from the dead, my body is going to undergo a remarkable transformation. Now, my resurrected body, my spiritual body, will have greater capacities and qualities. But here's what I want you to really see this morning. Is that our bodies, when they go through this transformation, will be perfectly formed for where we are going to spend our eternal destination, either eternal life or eternal punishment. Now, Paul not only says what's going to happen when this life ends, but he says when it's going to happen. He writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 through 52, Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. When Paul mentions the trumpet sounding, he's making reference to the second coming of Jesus Christ. On that day, in that moment, everything's going to change just like that. Transformation. Blink of an eye. Take a breath. It's changed. But please don't be duped into thinking that Jesus is not going to come during your lifetime. He may not, but he might. And for us to be caught by surprise would be the worst possible thing that could happen. So live this life in preparation for the next. That's what Jesus emphasizes in John chapter 5 and verse 28 through 29. He says, Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming... When all who are in their graves will hear his voice, and they'll come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. How we spend our lives here will determine whether or not we spend our future life, our eternal life, with Jesus in the new heavens and the new earth, or we will be completely separated from Jesus which is the ultimate death. Now, that's not to say that we merit eternal life with Jesus Christ. There's no possible way that you or I could do enough good to earn or deserve life with Jesus in the new heavens and the new earth. But because of Christ's work on the cross, life is available to us if we place our faith in Jesus Christ. As the Apostle Paul reminds us in Ephesians chapter 2, and I'm going to paraphrase this, verse 8 and 9, but he basically says this, For you are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, not by works. It's faith in Jesus Christ, but at the same time, it's the way you live. It's your works that gives evidence to whether or not you have a true faith in Jesus. It speaks volumes. So the world would have us to believe that since we only have one life to live, well, then we might as well do whatever our little heart desires. YOLO, baby, right? That's the way we ought to live our life. Paul comes along and he says to everyone who's been duped by that lie, please listen. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 34, and then verse 58. Come back to your senses as you ought. Stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God, and I say this to your shame. Verse 58, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know 
that your labor in the Lord is not vain. This life is not the only life. This life is simply a dress rehearsal for the next. So don't be duped. Don't waste your life. Seek God. Do His work in this world. Praise Jesus Christ who gave up everything so that you might have life. And ready yourself for the best is yet to come.